Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Houston, Texas is a city that has been known for a long list of achievements. The world's capital of space exploration, air conditioning and international energy, construction, oil and gas, home to the largest sports arenas. Houston at one time even led the highest numbers of capital punishment worldwide. But there's more. According to the FBI, a few bad actors in the city, among the near 3 million citizens, gave Houston another distinctive name but notorious in nature – the armored car robbery capital of the world, and for good reason. A series of deadly armored car robberies plagued the city of H-Town as security guards tasked with couring the money were either badly wounded or ruthlessly executed by a sophisticated crew of masked, heartless criminals inbred with the ingenious ability and fearlessness that led them to ambush the couriers in broad daylight. In 2019, the FBI reported that half of armored car robberies in the United States alone happened in Houston. For example, between 2013 and 2016, FBI records show there were at least 30 attempted armored car robberies in Harris County in Texas, with an astounding high of 11 attempts just in 2013 alone. One robbery crew stole over $4 million from an armored car heist at the University of Houston. You see groups of four, five, and sometimes as much as six or eight, said Sergeant David Helms with the Houston Police Department Violent Crime Task Force. By the time they get out of prison, they're older and they're looking to hit that big score, and I think they believe that's in the armored truck, he says. Dr. Everett Penn, a professor of criminology at UH Clear Lake, affirmed that the sheer number of opportunities – thousands of banks and ATMs spread across the sprawling city, including the distance armored cars must drive to service the ATMs – could easily account for the increased number of armored car robberies. According to FBI Special Agent Shauna Dunlap, each and every one of these crimes is serious and alarming because in each incident you have armed robbers with more aggressiveness willing to go up against an armed guard. The FBI and Houston Police, North Division Tactical Unit, were in hot pursuit of these phantom gangster killers, but police lagged far behind to reel them in to face justice. During a particularly violent robbery, the armored car guard was shot, and while the guard lay on the ground, he mustered enough strength to fire off multiple shots, nearly striking one of the masked robbers, forcing the crew to flee empty-handed. Determined to get rich or die trying, the violent thieves returned with a vengeance like the character Jason on Friday the 13th. Those carrying out these robberies simply modified and refined their robbery strategy by using superior technology and high-powered weapons to murder armed car guards from a distance to get the money by any means necessary. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and if you're already a member of this Weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen. Recommending Weird Darkness to others helps make it possible for me to keep doing the show. And while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com, where you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more. In this episode, the man who fronted as a real estate investor, but he robbed and murdered armored truck guards for a living. We'll look at the FBI's manhunt for Houston's North Side Sniper. So bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Houston, 
Houston, Texas. Thursday, February 12, 2015. The time? Between 1.50 p.m. and 2 p.m. On a pleasant, warm winter day, a Brinks 500 Series armored car rolls onto the Strip Center at 57 Westheimer where the 22-story Capital One Plaza is located, just a few blocks from the lavish Galleria Shopping Mall, one of the most exclusive places to shop in the city. As patrons either headed into the mall or were leaving, the massive impenetrable armored car, outfitted with bulletproof windows, stopped in front of Capital One Bank on the ground floor. Tucked inside the steel-plated vehicle were two Brinks guards, Bertha Boone and Alvin Kinney. Both had been working for Brinks for over 10 years or more. Kinney, age 60, was known as the messenger because his assignment was to carry the coal bags. Coal bags are packed with cash and the guard carries money to and from businesses, banks, and ATMs. Clad in a bulletproof vest, armed with a large caliber weapon, Alvin Kinney was loaded and ready if confronted by a robber. When the vehicle finally came to a stop, Kinney swung open the rear door. Then he rolled a metal cart onto a lift gate and lowered the cart to the ground. Then Kinney closed the door. Next, he made sure to check his surroundings. With the coast clear, Kinney pushed the cart into the entryway of the bank. Shortly, Kinney reappeared and headed to the armored truck with large bags of cash. As he got closer to the vehicle, three masked men clad in body armor rushed Kinney like running backs. Suddenly, as intense fear took over, Kinney hollered, but one of the men paid no mind and quickly aimed his rifle, firing off a shot that left a gaping hole in Kinney's head. Fatally wounded, Kinney slumped to the ground. Working in succession, the suspects backed up a white Ford F-150 truck to where the rear door of the armored truck was already open and the crew hurriedly offloaded around $1 million in cash from the Brinks truck, placing the money into the bed of the F-150 vehicle. Realizing the robbery had gone down, Bertha Boone activated the truck's siren, flung open her door, leaned out, and fired her weapon several times at the rear of the vehicle. In rapid response, the robbers returned fire at Boone, but they missed her as she dove back into the vehicle. The robbers escaped capture by speeding off in the F-150. Houston police and a team of FBI agents assigned to the Houston's field office of the Violent Crime Task Force swarmed the bank. Terribly shaken by the ordeal that stole the life of a fine, dedicated, and likable co-worker, Bertha Boone gave police a complete statement about what went down. After police carefully studied the video from the bank's surveillance cameras, they discovered the Ford F-150 truck recovered in a parking garage. A license plate check proved the officers hunched the vehicle had been stolen. Apparently, though, the crooks had parked the vehicle and drove off in a getaway ride. The getaway driver was genetically described by a witness as a black male whose face was not covered by a mask. The scant clues the police accumulated led to dead ends. A $100,000 reward never produced any solid leads either. In Houston, a Crime Stoppers reward of $5,000 or even less money has helped police to solve double and triple murders. So why did no one come forward with information to make $100,000? The killers were missing in action. The other hit went down on November 6, 2015, at approximately 2 p.m., when a Loomis armored truck arrived at Bank of America on North Shepard. A guard exited the vehicle and went into the bank. Heading back to the armored vehicle with the cash, seemingly out of nowhere, a black man armed with a high-caliber rifle wearing a mask, a bulletproof vest, and a gray long-sleeved hoodie eased out of a stolen white Jeep. Swift as a panther, the gun-toting assailant ran towards the guard, aimed his rifle, and squeezed the trigger as the hot slugs struck the guard's body. Miraculously, the guard was not hurt too badly as he stumbled back towards the armored truck. Unable to steal the money bags, the robber shooter ran off from the scene. FBI task force and Houston police soon arrived to question witnesses and check the surveillance videos. Officers pondered among themselves if the shooter was the same actor in Alvin Kinney's death. The police offered a $150,000 reward for information to arrest the armed robber. Nothing of value came forward, just as no leads were provided in Kinney's death at Capital One. For a while, it appeared the armored truck robbers cooled off a little or maybe they still had money left over from other robberies. On March 18, 2016, 
A shade past noon, another Loomis armored truck roared up to J.P. Morgan Chase Bank on Airline Drive on the north side of Houston. A guard named Melvin Moore carried a cash-filled tray to stock the bank's outdoor ATM with crisp, brand-new bills. While reloading the ATM, a hail of gunshots struck Moore. He fell to the ground, grimacing in pain. Meanwhile, in clockwork fashion, a black Nissan Altima sped toward the wounded guard, and quick as a cat, a robber in the back seat leaped from the vehicle to steal the money tray. But Moore was unbelievably still alive. He pulled his side weapon and fired at the robber, who jumped back into the Altima as it raced from the parking lot. Moore, a 32-year-old married father of four young children, dropped his weapon to the ground and died instantly. What surprised the bewildered officers this time was that after they concluded watching the bank's surveillance video, there was no image of the shooter who cold-bloodedly gunned down Alvin Moore. They managed to see on camera that the suspects had been patiently waiting in the parking lot prior to the arrival of the armored truck. The surveillance video clearly shows that the masked robbers who confronted Moore were armed with handguns. Neither suspect appeared to have fired a shot even as Moore bounced up from the ground like an Energizer bunny, drew his pistol, and seemingly shot one of the robbers. Autopsy findings on Moore's body triggered the officer's curiosity into overdrive. Alvin Moore was killed by a .223 high-powered rifle. No witnesses recalled seeing a rifle. Investigators painstakingly re-interviewed each witness. Perhaps they were wrong about what they saw. Are you sure you didn't see anyone with a rifle?" an investigator asked a witness. Each witness concurred that they did not see a rifle. In Chris Anderson's book about the case titled The Sniper, Anderson recalls how an officer said maybe they used a sniper. Referring to the sniper theory, Anderson writes, "...it had never been seen before, even in the most sophisticated of robbery crews." A sniper was the stuff of elite military units, political assassinations, or Hollywood movies. A real-life sniper roaming around untouchable in the heart of Houston? Anderson continued, Many of the investigators didn't want to entertain the idea. It was an even lower level of sociopathic criminality. Cold-blooded murder first, then rob. Determined to nail the violent thugs, the FBI task force released a video to the TV news media and other media outlets which explicitly showed the shooter opening fire on the guard. A $15,000 reward was also offered for pertinent information leading to the capture of the rifleman. Like the Capital One robbery murder, police never received the magic clue to identify who these guys were. Investigators held their breath, hoping the bloodshed would stop but the killers struck again on Monday, August 29, 2016, at Wells Fargo Bank on Northwest Freeway. Shortly before 6 p.m., a Brinks armored truck pulled up to the ATM section where 25-year-old David Guzman was about to place new money trays into an ATM when a burst of gunshots crackled the air. Guzman, paralyzed by the slugs, slumped to the ground. Next, a blue Toyota sedan sped quickly to where Guzman fell, and a masked robber rushed out from the back seat. First, he sprayed Guzman's face with mace to blur his eyes. Then, the cat robber grabbed the money tray from the dying Guzman and rushed back to the Toyota. Inside, the money tray was a big lick, $120,000. When the FBI and Houston police obtained an outdoor video security camera from an extended Stay America hotel located across the street from Wells Fargo Bank, investigators discovered a tantalizing clue while watching the video. Agents spotted on the video a white Toyota 4Runner pulling slowly into the hotel's parking lot at 2.54 p.m., approximately three hours prior to the shooting. The Toyota backed into a parking space to set the rear of the 4Runner to face the bank. The same vehicle left the hotel's parking lot at 5.57 p.m., very shortly after the shooting of the Brinks guard, David Guzman. As the investigators watched the video, they noticed something extremely interesting. Between 2.54 p.m. and a couple of minutes or so before 6 p.m., not a living soul emerged from the vehicle. This chain of events triggered deep brainstorming among the officers. Why did the driver of the Toyota park at a hotel for three hours and suddenly drive away right after the shooting? Was the driver the person who murdered Guzman? 
if this happened, why did the hotel's video not show the killer exiting from the vehicle carrying a rifle? The strange circumstances surrounding the white Toyota left the officer's thoughts reeling in orbit. What did all of this mean? Has the sniper theory evolved into a cold reality of the day? What is true is that behind every unsolved mystery, someone somehow does know the truth. Houston Police Homicide Sergeant Jason Robles received a call from an informant who had worked on drug cases for an investigator at the Harris County District Attorney's Office in Houston, Harris County, Texas. I saw the evening news about the murder of the Brinks guard, and I think I know who did it, the person said. Who is it? Robles asked, not sure if the guy knew what he was talking about. We call him Red, and I think his last name is Batista. The informant explained to Robles that he had known Red for years and that Red robbed armored trucks. The informant further explained that Red was highly professional at robbing armored trucks and that he would follow armored trucks each day to learn the routines and schedules of the guards who handled the money, Red lived in the Acres home area, that Red shoots the guards from a distance with an assault rifle with a scope on it, Red practices with the rifle near a bayou in Acres home, he owns different vehicles, a black Wrangler, Jeep, a black Cadillac, and he uses these vehicles to watch the armored trucks. Living an expensive lifestyle, the informant said, Red needed to rob at least three or four armed trucks per year, and that Red stashed other vehicles used in robberies at a north side apartment not too far from Acres' home. Around September of 2016, FBI agents and Houston Police North Division Tactical Unit began to hunt for a dubious character whom they determined to be 36-year-old Redrick Javon Batista, or AKA Red. Batista, an African-American, appeared to many as a typical, young, single fella living an ordinary life. Batista lived with two bulldogs in a large two-bedroom house at 1351 Tarberry Street in Acres' home. Tall and handsome, with a narrow face, low, trimmed hair, curved, bushy eyebrows, and long, pointed nose. People familiar with Batista have said that he possessed a generous heart and was often seen walking his bulldogs in the neighborhood where he lived police determined that Batista was a real estate investor with the hope of becoming a rich real estate developer. Batista had no job or any known substantial income to buy real estate. So the billion-dollar question raged like fire. Where did Batista get his money to fund real estate projects? Acres Homes, where Batista lived on Tarberry Street, represents a lower-to-middle income community. Some residents still exist in old shotgun houses built on wooden lots, government-funded apartments, and small homes in subdivisions scattered throughout the region. There was also the middle class who built expensive homes in Acres Homes. Located 10 miles northwest of downtown Houston, Acres Homes is a nine-square-mile area that is loosely bounded within the city limits of West Gulf Bank Road to the north, Pinemont Drive to the south, North Shepherd Drive to the east, and Albonson Drive to the west. Known for its bevy of cowboys, rodeos, horse riders, trail riders, gumbo, hot food stands, rap music block parties, and young men hanging out at the car wash at Little York and West Montgomery showing off their freshly painted rides, capped off with shiny rims, and there's more. Don't forget the Zydeco music blaring from beer joints. Acres Homes is nonetheless a unique mix of rural and urban. Once labeled the South's largest unincorporated African-American community, Acres Homes was developed during World War I. Acres Homes earned its distinctive name because during the World War I era, the land was sold primarily to African-Americans by the acreage. Cheap land offered rural settlers sufficient space to raise livestock and grow gardens. These days, residents affectionately call Acres Homes the 44 a term used to describe the city's metro bus that zooms down West Montgomery, transporting passengers to their destination, or it's referred to as acreage shaker, depending who you talk with. Some of the best barbecue joints in the city of Houston lie in the heart of Acres Homes. One of the most popular spots in town is the family-owned Burns Barbecue, located at 8307 DePriest Street.
This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. Born on January 23, 1979, investigators and a Texas Monthly Magazine reporter discovered Redrick Batista was the only child of Roy and Joyce Batista. Both parents worked blue-collared, well-paid jobs to support themselves and their doting son. As a child beginning in kindergarten, Batista attended private schools, wore expensive clothing, and every need he needed was fulfilled. Growing up into a slender-built teenager, Batista played junior high school basketball. On Sunday, Batista's parents took him to attend Mount Horeb Missionary Baptist Church in the Fourth Ward on Gray Street. We loved him and he loved us, said Joyce Batista during an interview with Texas Monthly Magazine reporter Skip Hollinsworth. Between 1996 and springtime in 2016, Batista racked up several low-level criminal convictions in the Houston area. His criminal history showed arrests for weapon possession, misdemeanor assault, marijuana possession, driving while intoxicated, evading arrest in a motor vehicle, suspended license, and evading detection. Nothing in Batista's background suggested he was a cold-hearted killer. A prominent female pastor who birthed a child with Batista described him as a charming gentleman. Redrick is a nice guy. He laughed a lot. Batista's child that he sired with the pastor died at age five due to recurring health problems. A second attractive girlfriend also birthed a child, a girl with Batista. Despite Batista's best efforts to avoid trouble, a magnet drew him deeper into a web of crime. He hit the big time in the year 2000 when a judge gave him six years in federal prison for illegally purchasing a firearm. Thereafter, Batista served state prison time for using stolen credit cards, in 2009, he spent an additional 30 days on credit card abuse. Determined not to return to prison, Batista went to work for a man identified as Tommy Albert who owned a home construction and delivery business. Albert told a Texas Monthly reporter that Red was a person avidly interested in many topics. He would sit at the computer for hours just doing general research. He'd read about it from Muhammad Ali to Dick Gregory, Albert said. During Valentine's weekend in 2013, Batista met a young girl named Bucci Ako at a party. Ako, a goal-oriented young lady, was a former volleyball player. She also had a real estate license prior to becoming a car salesperson. After a whirlwind romance, Ako gave birth to Batista's infant daughter. Police suspicions would later intensify once they discovered, to their utter amazement, that Ako had been employed as a car salesperson at Stewart Cadillac. Based on critical intelligence that the police accumulated about Redrick Batista, a strategic decision was made for police to obtain a warrant to attach a GPS tracking system, or GPS, on Batista's Jeep. A second warrant was approved for agents to also place a GPS tracker on Batista's girlfriend's car, identified as Bucci Co. Both GPS warrants were approved by a judge on September 3, 2016. Retired Houston Police Sergeant Chris Anderson, who wrote about Batista's crimes in his published book, said, We suspected that Batista and the other known members of his crew were highly organized serial business type robbery crew. They were also serial killers, and the clock was ticking down for their next planned robbery slash murder. Officers David Smith, Steve Zakaria, Ben LeBlanc, and Houston Police North Division Tactical Unit Sergeant Chris Anderson drove to Flossie May Street to check out whether a Co's vehicle was available to place the tracking device on it. Each time Zakaria trudged onto the driveway holding the GPS device, the dog inside the house barked crazily. After both unsuccessful attempts to execute the job on a Co's new Cadillac CTS, the officers went searching for Batista's Jeep. Officers found it at 1351 Tarbury in Acres Homes, where Batista went to sleep every night. While other officers waited in an undercover vehicle, Zakaria eased on to Batista's front yard, crawled under the Jeep Wrangler, 
and quickly put three GPS trackers on the vehicle. Police eventually succeeded in placing the tracker on a coast Cadillac as she hustled to sell new Cadillacs at Sterling McCall dealership on Southwest Freeway to make a living. For three long months, FBI and members of the Houston Police North Division Tactical Unit followed Batista's vehicle. On one occasion, officers discreetly trailed Batista to the intersection of West Little York Road and North Houston Roslyn Road. At this location, there is a Chase Bank with ATM machines installed in the parking lot. Just so happened, Batista made it to the location when the ATMs were being refilled with cash by a Brinks armored truck guard. Suddenly, when Batista saw the action, he spun around into the bank's parking lot with his Jeep. Strategically, he positioned himself at an angle where the guards most likely did not see him. Police on surveillance readied themselves to shoot Batista if he went for the kill, but he did not move. Like a patient mentor, Batista watched the time frame it took for the guard to finish refilling the ATM trays with money. Once the Brinks truck left, officers keenly observed that Batista remained sitting in his spot across the parking lot near the bank. Perhaps they thought Batista wanted to document the time frame when the guards arrived with the money and to determine the layout of the area, where to position himself, to later return for a score of cash, shoot the guard, then have his partners in crime run over to where the guard would fall and scoop up the money. It all made sense. Police were convinced they had spotted the phantom killer of the armored guards. He's our guy, an officer said, with a trace of delight in his raspy voice. Next, based on the time frame when Batista headed further up north from Acres Homes, investigators found the white Toyota 4Runner SUV located at a large apartment project. When police ran a check on the vehicle, it came back stolen over a year ago. While inspecting the vehicle, the officers discovered that a hole had been cut into the tailgate of the vehicle, a hole large enough to position a scope-mounted rifle and fire shots through the hole. The setup, the hole in the tailgate, was perfect for a sniper. We found a Toyota. The tailgate has a big hole enough to put a rifle in and shoot your target, Sergeant Anderson told his lieutenant and captain. A GPS tracker was placed on the Toyota and Houston Police CID investigators installed a pole camera close to where the vehicle was parked to monitor who drove it and when. Police documented every move that Batista made. What worried the officers was whether Batista would find the GPS trackers on his vehicle. Before long, other players emerged into the picture. Were they killers as well? Police observed Batista meeting with two fellas, an Acres Homes guy named Nelson Polk, age 37, and Batista met with Polk's 46-year-old uncle, Mark Hill. Polk and Hill were ex-convicts. Polk served prison time for drug and firearm offenses while Hill served time on drugs, including assault charges. Polk was not a high roller like Batista and Hill. He scampered around town doing menial jobs to survive, and he needed a nice money hustle. His uncle Bark Hill, however, enjoyed the trappings of entrepreneur success. Hill owned a popcorn gourmet store called Popcorn Crush, a cemetery cleanup crew, and a welding shop, including a tractor company specializing in hauling rocks and clearing land. Police pondered whether Nelson Polk and Mark Hill were accomplices in Batista's robbery-murder spree. The officers were not sure, but they sought to find out. To ramp up their efforts, a judge granted the officers permission to place a GPS tracker on Mark Hill's Toyota Camry on November 8, 2016. Hill's routine was initially dull, until November 21st, shortly before 8 a.m. The GPS tracked Hill's movements toward Amagi Bank, right off Sam Houston Parkway, north I-45. According to police reports and court records, Hill's vehicle remained in the Abogee Bank parking lot for three hours, and he did not work anywhere around there. Exactly 30 minutes after Hill left the bank, mastermind Redrick Batista drove up in a Jeep Wrangler. He hung around until 5 p.m. Acting like security guards themselves, Hill and Batista watched Abogee Bank like hawks. The next morning, November 22nd, as citizens headed to work, Hill rushed over to Amagee Bank parking lot and stayed for two hours. Taking turns at their stakeout, Batista arrived close to 11 a.m. Incredibly, Batista stayed there for almost seven excruciating hours. On the third day, same routine. Batista arrived at the bank around 8.20 a.m. 
At 11.30, a Loomis armored car pulled up to the bank's ATM machines located outdoors. Police watched through binoculars as Batista, his eyes fixed in a stare, watched the guard refill the ATM's money trays. Subsequently, Hill returned to the bank in a black Infiniti QX56. When the armored car left, Batista and Hill drove in separate vehicles to Greenpoint Mall, where Nelson Polk, driving a beat-up Chevy van, met the pair. Task Force officers watched the three men talk, presumably strategizing a hit, before they hopped into their vehicle and returned to the immediate area of Amogee Bank. The Dynamot duos drove up and down different streets as if they were plotting escape routes. Then they left and went in different directions. They checked out the streets to determine their escape routes. They're going to rob another armed truck, kill the guard, and steal the money, Anderson said. Not a single officer disagreed. One officer suggested the robbers needed Christmas money. On November 29th, a federal judge signed a Title III interception order that allowed the FBI agents and Houston police officers to tap Batista's cell phone calls to listen to whom he was calling, when he was calling, and whoever called him. Interestingly, FBI agents issued a search warrant to grab a hold of Batista's historical cell phone records. The records revealed a treasure trove of clues to prove Batista's approximate location when the armored guard couriers were murdered. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. In late November 2016, a federal judge had signed an interception order allowing the FBI and Houston police to tap their prime suspect, 36-year-old Redrick Javon Batista's cell phone calls, and access his historical cell phone records. The content of those records told them some valuable information. Here's a rundown of what the records showed. Prior to Loomis guard David Guzman's death on August 29, 2016, during the Wells Fargo bank raid, Batista's cell phone pinged off of the cell towers that placed his cell phone near the Wells Fargo Bank on Hollister Road and Highway 290. Police felt strongly that when Batista's phone repeatedly pinged in this area shortly before Guzman was killed, that Batista was scouting the area to determine the spot where he would position himself as the sniper. Other calls to Batista's phone showed the person or persons were in the immediate area just a few hours before Guzman was murdered. The two additional cell phones that FBI agent Jeff Coughlin identified in connection with Batista's phone in the August 29 sniper attack were linked to Mark Anthony Hill and his crooked nephew, Nelson Alexander Polk. Batista's movement and constant communication with other crew members convinced Houston police officers and FBI agents that the next hit on their list was none other than Amogee Bank at Sam Houston Parkway. The stage was set for a dramatic showdown. The biggest breakthrough at this point happened when FBI and Houston police cracked the code to Redrick Batista's strategy on a stolen vehicle and, like vengeful adversaries, the police used it against him. We knew the next armored car would be robbed at Amogee Bank, Houston Police Sergeant Chris Anderson said. The scheme began to slowly unravel. Batista had a young lady to rent a new, black 2016 Jeep Cherokee from Enterprise Leasing. The woman drove the rented vehicle back to Batista's home on Tarberry Street. In a call to a robbery crew member, Batista lodged a complaint, saying he was having trouble trying to copy this expletive mother expletive. Hours later, Batista returned the vehicle to the rental agency. 
Confused agents questioned why Batista returned the vehicle so soon. Police raced to the scene and retrieved the Jeep, realizing Batista probably made a duplicate key to later steal the vehicle when another customer rented and parked it. Once police had the Jeep, a check of the two keys showed that one of the keys did not work. FBI agent Coughlin summoned the Strategic Vehicle Technologies Unit, or SVTU, from Virginia to travel to Houston's Ellington Air Force Base to install their covert technology on the Jeep. In a cat-and-mouse game that played out like the plot of a best-selling Dick Tracy drama, when FBI SVTU agents examined the undercarriage of the vehicle, they soon discovered that Batista had installed his own GPS device to track the vehicle and steal it back, presumably to do a heist. To outwit the suspected sniper killer, FBI installed its own GPS tracker, wired the vehicle with an audio sound recorder and video camera recorder, plus a kill switch to shut off the motor if the killers tried to escape. As expected, Batista tracked down the Jeep after a customer rented it and stole it back. December 7th is game day, police overheard Batista say to his crime partners over the phone. The Christmas holiday was rapidly approaching the city as bright, sparkling lights twinkled across the skies of Houston. The lights in the Galleria and downtown area reminded patrons of Christmas Wonderland. This time of year is supposed to be a season of goodwill towards mankind, celebrations with family, close friends, having fun, stockings filled with gifts, images of Santa and his reindeers, and just simply enjoying life while waiting for what the new year brings. With the holiday spirit filling the atmosphere, Houston Police Sergeant Chris Anderson and his tactical unit, reinforced by the FBI crew, knew all too well that evil does not take the holidays off. They were on the hunt for a real-life sniper whom they were convinced was a serial killer and robber whose M.O. was to kill first, then rob, and steal bags of cold, hard cash. In a plot straight out of a high-octane blockbuster movie, Houston police and FBI agents would take a big gamble with the serial robbery killer crew by disguising themselves as armored guards. The ingenious scheme was to deck out in the same color and style of the uniform that Brinks and Loomis guards often wore. There would be two armored trucks, Brinks and Loomis, driven to Amogee Bank by police officers. It was my idea to dress one of my guys as an armored truck guard, Sergeant Anderson told me when I talked to him about the case. On Wednesday, December 7, 2016, the mission to kill the armored guard and take the cash money to win a big score before Christmas was about to take place. FBI, ATF agents, Houston Police North Division Tactical Unit, Houston Police SWAT Team, and additional undercover police officers, including a Houston Police helicopter, were near the bank and its immediate surroundings. At least half a dozen times, the robbery crew surveilled the bank's parking lot to determine the exact time when the guards arrived with the money. Okay, let's do this, Batista could be heard saying over the phone. Feeling the urge to hear the voice of his baby's mother, Buccia Co., Batista called her from his cell phone. I love you, he said in a gentle tone. I love you too, Oka murmured. Nothing is more important than what you and I have, Oka said, according to the Texas Monthly article. Batista was eerily silent before replying in a soft tone, Okay. As if guided by unforeseen fate, Batista called Tommy Albert, the man that he occasionally worked for. I love you, Tommy, Batista said in a sincere voice. Before long, Batista headed to Amogee Bank on Sam Houston Parkway. Sergeant Chris Anderson forewarned the officers set to take Batista down. The sniper is a serial killer. He's going to shoot it out. Batista's accomplices, Nelson Polk and Trevi Duncan Bush, were riding in the stolen Toyota 4Runner, the same vehicle that Batista had previously used as a sniper's den to kill armored guards. Officers spotted Mark Hill driving a black Infiniti QX56. Crew members John Scott and Benny Phillips were at the scene, ready to assist in ripping off the money bags and aiding the group's getaway. Officers suspected the players in the Toyota 4Runner would drive up to the befallen guard and snatch the cash, presumably as the sniper, Batista, would shoot the guard from a distance with the scope-mounted .223 caliber rifle, while Mark Hill made counter-conducted rounds around the area of the Amogee Bank, Batista parked his Cherokee Jeep in a nearby apartment parking lot, approximately 150 yards away from the Amogee ATMs across the bayou behind a chain-link fence. The kill shot was about ready. 
Police overheard John Scott on the phone when he told Batista, Bentley's coming your way. Bentley was the code word for armored truck, Sergeant Anderson recalled. I'm setting up for the shot, Batista hollered back. Simultaneously, police officers sprang into action mode. What Batista saw in his scope was a police officer sitting in the Loomis truck to distract him while the officer driving the Brinks truck rammed the Toyota 4Runner with the robbers inside waiting for Batista to kill the officer disguised as a Loomis guard. The noise from the crash jarred Nelson Polk and John Scott. Their eyes bulged in fear to see that a 25,000-pound steel truck had struck their vehicle with a thunderous force. The guards were trying to kill them, they figured. Polk and John Scott leapt out running like scared rabbits. He's got a gun, an FBI spotter told a SWAT officer, positioned in a parking garage adjacent to the bank. Incredibly, the SWAT officer fired off two quick 308 rifle shots at the pistol carrier, but the SWAT shooter badly missed his running target. Heavily armed tactical officers forced Nelson Polk and John Scott to surrender or be killed on the spot. Officers managed to stop Mark Hill's vehicle and arrest him also. The other two were rounded up as well. But a more dangerous drama would play out. Police teetered on edge as their SWAT officers were about to come face-to-face -face with Redrick Batista, a bloodthirsty killer, just as he began staring into the scope of his high-powered rifle. The SWAT team hurriedly drove onto the apartment's parking lot. They used their police car to block Batista's Jeep. First, an officer detonated a stun grenade over the jeep. The grenade exploded with a loud blast, shooting out a bright flash. Realizing the gig was up, Batista cranked the jeep to get out of the parking lot, yet when he flipped the engine switch, the vehicle would not start. Police listening in on the installed audio recordings inside the jeep overheard Batista repeatedly muttering expletives to himself as he kept trying to start the vehicle. Unfortunately for Batista, FBI technical officers had earlier successfully disabled the switch. Sweating profusely, Batista was not about to surrender. Quickly, he flung open the door of the Jeep, firing off rifle shots at the officers. With precise accuracy, a Houston police SWAT officer returned the favor, striking Batista in the chest and leg. Despite being shot, Batista still attempted to climb over the fence, but he was too weak to fight, too weak to make it to safety. While grappling to get a firm grip, an officer shot Batista in the back with a taser. Falling to the ground, officers handcuffed Batista, placing him in official custody. Batista's recovered weapon was a .223 caliber rifle fashioned into an AR-15. Houston's North Side sniper had finally been captured. An officer rode in the ambulance with Batista as his bloody body lay uncomfortably on a stretcher headed to Ben Taub Hospital. Sergeant Chris Anderson's book, The Sniper, vividly describes Batista's final words. Batista mumbled to the officer riding with him, so this is how it feels to die. Upon arrival at the hospital, the sniper, Frederick Batista, had already passed away. A quick search by police of the stolen Jeep that Batista drove to the scene to execute the deadly robbery revealed just how odd and ironic he was. In the Jeep, officers found a book Batista had been reading called how Successful People Think by John C. Maxwell. The attempted armored car robbery made headline news on TV stations in Houston. The newly hired Houston police chief arrived at the scene to give a press conference. Acevedo alluded to how amazing it was that the suspects got tangled in their own web of deceit and took the bait when both armored trucks arrived at Amogee Bank. Unfortunately for the suspects, those armored cars were being driven by members of the Houston Police Department who were hopeful that today we'd be able to take these criminals into custody and make Houston safer, Acevedo said. Commenting on Batista's failed attempt to murder police officers, Acevedo said, It is important for our community to know that our officers tried to save the life of the suspect who just tried to kill Houston police officers. What goes on in the mind of a murderous killer? What is it about some people that lead them to commit murder? Is there something that is different, or is it simply a switch that gets turned on? Murderous Minds, Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines, offers a look into the lives of individuals who didn't just become killers, but who managed to avoid the media storm that usually accompanies them. Inside, 
you will hear about people like Sante Kimes, a 65-year-old mother who was driven by greed and who committed multiple murders with her son. Robert James Ackerman, the MBA graduate who murdered three people in order to continue getting lap dances from a stripper that he became infatuated with. Larry Jean Ashbrook, who became deluded into thinking that strangers were accusing him of murder. When he could not take it anymore, he carried out a massacre at the Wedgwood Baptist Church. And more. Each story harbors its own distinct narrative and reasoning for the perpetrators of these heinous crimes, along with the background to the case, their lives, and the aftermath of their actions. Sometimes the truth is more appalling than anything fiction can provide, and Murderous Minds proves it once again. Murderous Minds, Volume 1, Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escaped the Headlines by Ryan Becker, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample or purchase the title on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. After the chaos settled down at the scene at Amagi Bank, police hurriedly fetched a warrant to search Batista's home at 1351 Tarbury in Acres Homes. A second warrant was acquired to search Batista's cell phone. The search provided investigators with an insight into the inner workings of Batista's views of the world, his likes and dislikes. Investigators learned that Batista read several books about white supremacy in America and wrote extensive letters to black men serving time in prison for murdering white police officers. Sergeant Chris Anderson said in his book The Sniper that a Texas Monthly reporter managed to get the front cover of a book written by Batista titled The New America, Money, Murder, and Madness, an exclusive look into the heart of America from a free thinker. As officers continued to ransack the residence, they stumbled onto a fake suicide bomber vest. Was there a real one somewhere? What was Batista thinking? Harmless thoughts or crazy thoughts about suicide, maybe? Despite money wrappers found in Batista's freezer, along with $5,000 in cash in another location, police found no substantial amount of money taken from previous armored car robberies. Who ever heard of a sniper with his own personal gunsmith? This gunsmith sounds like a fictional character straight out of a fascinating spy movie. Curious thoughts aside, though, the real-life Roderick Batista indeed had his own personal gunsmith who was a Houston firefighter. Police tracked down the moonlighting gunsmith as they cracked the code on Batista's phone and searched through his contacts. The gunsmith revealed the following story to investigators concerning the gun business relationship that he had with the now-deceased Batista. The gunsmith said he manufactured fully automatic AR-15s for Batista, who sold them on the black market. He replaced the barrel on Batista's AR-15 weapon and made rifle suppressors for Batista, which reduced the sound and eliminated muzzle flash. Investigators speculated that the reason Batista had the barrels changed on his rifles was to destroy ballistic evidence, which would prevent firearms experts from making a match with Batista's gun, with the slugs recovered from the bodies of the armored guards he killed. None of the fired slugs received from the bodies of the guards he killed matched the gun that Batista was killed with at Amagi Bank. Redrick Batista, a.k.a. Red, had been dead for slightly over two years when his partners in crime went on trial in March 2019 in Houston Federal Court before Judge David Hitner, a.k.a. Hitman Hitner. Hitner was a no-nonsense, hard-nosed judge who hit guilty defendants with exceptionally long sentences. Nelson Polk, Mark Hill, John Edward Scott, and Benny Charles Phillips Jr. were all charged with attempted interference with commerce by robbery and aiding and abetting discharge of a firearm during a crime of violence. Trey V. Duncan Bush pled guilty for consideration of a lighter sentence and testified against the other four robbers. Mark Hill and Nelson Polk faced separate charges of aiding and abetting commerce robberies, including aiding the discharge of a firearm during a crime of violence that caused the death of Loomis armored car guard David Guzman. Meanwhile, as the trial peeled back the layers of the long-running deadly operation, Batista's death cast a large shadow over the trial. 
Lawyers for the men told jurors their clients did not know Batista planned to shoot and kill an armored car guard on December 7, 2016, outside the Amazon Bank. Attorney Nicole DeBoard represented Nelson Polk. Texas Southern District Federal Prosecutors Heather Winter and Rick Haynes alleged during separate intervals that when Loomis guard David Guzman was killed by the hidden sniper identified as Batista, that Polk was behind the wheel as a masked suspect jumped from the vehicle and scooped up a bag filled to the brim with $120,000. Federal prosecutors put on a cache of evidence during the nine-day trial. Excerpts from phone conversations that Batista had with his crime partners after the FBI tapped his phone, including GPS tracking data, surveillance photos showing the defendants meeting with Batista after Batista watched the Amagee Bank, audio and video footage from a rented Jeep Cherokee that Batista stole, a vehicle the police knew he planned to steal back from the rental place. This gave police the opportunity to gain the edge, and they bugged the Jeep, allowing them to watch and hear every move that Batista made as he prepared to knock off the armored truck guard carrying bags of cash dollars on December 7, 2016. Jurors also got a grand chance to see the hole in the tailgate of the stolen Toyota 4Runner that Batista used as his sniper nest to kill the guards at long range, the handiwork of an assassin. Only Mark Hill and Nelson Polk were charged in the killing of guard David Guzman. Police officers and FBI agents testified that John Scott was in the vicinity serving his role as a lookout man, while Mark Hill sat nearby in his vehicle ready to whisk Nelson Polk and Travis Bush off the scene after they ditched the stolen Toyota 4Runner. During closing arguments, DeBoard argued incessantly that Polk was the perfect patsy for Batista. Mr. Polk was homeless, living in a vacant lot down the street from Batista's house and Acres Homes when Batista recruited him for his robbery schemes. DeBoard further said, Polk thought he had figured out how to live a good life. She continued with zeal, saying, The government has an outstanding case against a very nasty individual, a manipulative, conniving, smart individual named Red Batista. We know how Batista manipulated throwaway human beings who had the misfortune to cross his path. Attorney David Cunningham argued that his client, Benny Charles Phillips, was innocent because on the day of the attempted robbery on December 7th, Phillips was not at the Amagee Bank because he was meeting with his parole officer. Mark Hill's attorney, Neil Davis, said during closing arguments that although prosecutors charged Hill in the robbery murder of the Loomis guard, David Guzman, the only evidence they had linking Hill to the crime is cell phone location data from cell towers evidence showed that Hill owned at least four different businesses. It makes no sense that this businessman, this family man, would rob banks just for a few thousand dollars, Davis insisted, hoping to disprove the evidence against his client. John Scott's attorney, Michael DeGuerin, argued that his client was an unwitting pawn in Batista's planned robbery of Amagee Bank and that Scott did not know Batista had a gun. Prosecutors sought to dispel the defense attorney's arguments that the clients didn't know what Batista planned to do during the robberies. Don't be fooled, these defendants were fully informed and fully vested, Assistant U.S. Attorney Heather Winter told the rapt jury. March 29, 2019 Following eight hours of deliberations, the seven women and five men on the jury convicted the four on every federal charge alleged against them. Family members of Nelson Polk said the trial was tainted from the beginning, Polk's sister-in-law, Brittany Polk, told Courthouse News that she does not think Nelson Polk nor his co-defendants received a fair trial. Referring to David Guzman's death, Polk said, "...there was no evidence linking them to the robbery at all. The only evidence linking Hill and Polk to the scene of the August robbery was cell tower data the prosecutors said showed the two men in the area," Polk added. Betty Phillips' parole officer testified on the stand that he was with her at the time of the attempted December robbery. The December incident happened when Batista was killed by police. Four months later, July 2, 2019, Judge Hitman Hitner struck with force. He hit all four defendants with heavy sentences. None of the men showed emotion as the draconian punishments were handed down in a packed courtroom. John Scott and Benny Charles Phillips were given life in federal jail, plus a consecutive 20 years for aiding and abetting in the failed robbery plot on December 7, 2016. Nelson Polk and Mark Hill received the same sentences for the December robbery attempt, 
including an additional life sentences for their alleged role in the 2016 robbery murder of Loomis guard David Guzman. Guzman's fiance, Lauren Martinez, spoke vigorously to Polk and Hill during a victim impact statement, emphasizing how Guzman was simply doing his job. You killed my husband, she said to Polk. You being a part of that crime, you knew what was going to happen. All four men vowed to appeal their cases. I've often joked about how instead of an energy drink, I need a motivation drink. They just don't exist, or so I thought. I was told recently about Magic Mind. They wanted me to consider promoting their product, but I never endorse anything unless I've tried it and approve of it first. After taking Magic Mind with my morning routine every day, along with my vitamins and my coffee as always, in less than a week, I was feeling more focused, more alert, and surprisingly, more motivated. I'm spending more time on what's important and getting more accomplished when doing so. My mood is better, making each day less stressful. Magic Mind is doctors validated. It has over 200 scientific studies behind each of the ingredients, like cognizine cytosoline, it's the best nootropics on the market, the highest possible grade matcha, organically grown mushrooms from California, and more. Magic Mind uses nano-encapsulation technology. It helps your body to absorb the good stuff that much faster and more efficiently. So, I gave them my stamp of approval. I even signed up for a monthly subscription of 30 bottles before telling them I approved. And now Magic Mind is giving you, my weirdo family, a special deal. Up to 48% off your first subscription or 20% off one-time purchase with the code DARKNESS at checkout. Go to magicmind.com slash darkness and then use the code DARKNESS at checkout. In January 2017, FBI Special Agent Jeff Coughlin, whose work was instrumental in helping Houston police bring down Redrick Batista, happened to be at home watching TV when a story aired about the unsolved murder of a prominent African-American businessman identified as Carol Oliver. Oliver was murdered during a robbery at the McDonald's franchise he owned located at I-10 and Lockwood at the Fifth Ward in January 2016. During an exchange of gunfire with the robbers, who were in a white Toyota 4Runner, Oliver fired off two shots that struck the SUV. The men got away. Bravely wounded, Oliver died. There had been heavy pressure on the Houston Police Department's Homicide Division to solve that case. A rush of adrenaline coursed through FBI agent Jeff Coughlin's veins when he heard the reporter say there was a white SUV recorded on the surveillance camera in the McDonald's parking lot. Excited over what he had heard, the agent contacted Detective Phil Waters to get a better rundown on Oliver's murder. Waters told the agent the murder of Carol Oliver's was a straight-up robbery rip. Mr. Oliver was walking into the parking lot with the bank deposit money when the two armed black males wearing masks approached Mr. Oliver, Waters explained to the agent. Waters further told the agent how Oliver fired back at the suspects. They took the bank bags, filled with cash, and fled in a white SUV, he said. During an extended conversation with Waters, FBI agent Coughlin discovered a hot lead. Oliver fired off rounds that apparently didn't strike the suspects, but one or more rounds that Oliver fired did strike the white SUV that the robbers were riding in. Evidence showed the businessman Mr. Oliver was murdered by a 40 caliber bullet. The medical examiner, in fact, removed a 40 caliber bullet from Oliver's body. FBI agent Coughlin's gut instinct led him to believe the murder of Carol Oliver was done by the handiwork of none other than Redrick Batista and the members of his crew. The white Toyota SUV that Batista used as a sniper's den in prior armed car robberies was the same vehicle confiscated at the scene when Batista was killed by police. FBI technicians successfully retrieved a 40 caliber slug from the SUV's frame structure. Comparisons of the 40 caliber slug retrieved from Oliver's body to the 40 caliber slug taken from the white SUV 4Runner matched perfectly. Batista and his crew murdered Carol Oliver. Based on the historical analysis of the cell phone retrieved from Batista after police killed him, evidence proved that during the evening and approximate time when millionaire Cadillac dealership owner Joe Stewart was killed on May 7, 2015, Batista's cell phone pinged like crazy in the immediate area where Stewart was shot in his garage. 
Police suspect the crew placed a GPS tracker on Stewart's Cadillac vehicle and tracked him to his home. Who knows how many people Redrick Batista may have killed? Family and friends arrived at Serenity Mortuary on Windswept Lane in southwest Houston to pay their last respects to Redrick Batista. He was a young man whose life was full of potential for success early on, a young man who often tried to steer young men away from a life of crime. But in a strange, perverse way, Batista immersed himself in a life of crime, even willing to shed innocent blood to have the power of money that didn't belong to him. The atmosphere melted together with soft, spiritual music playing in the background. The sadness alleviated a bit when friends and classmates of Batista reminisced about his goals, school days, his desire to become a real estate developer, build a strip center and build low-income housing for the poor in Houston's Acres homes where he grew up, and how he did simple chores by helping neighbors to assemble their computers. A well-dressed pastor led those in attendance and prayer. There were those whose eyes swelled with tears as the pastor spoke of life after death and why people should not judge other people's lives. As mourners intermittently entered in and out of the chapel, they spotted a book sitting atop a wooden table titled, Do You? Twelve Laws to Access the Power in You to Achieve Happiness and Success by Russell Simmons, including a shiny plaque that aptly reads, Don't Measure the Size of the Mountain, Talk to the One Who Can Move It. Redrick Javon Batista was cremated into dark gray ashes. His goal was to become rich or die trying to fulfill a dream of becoming a real estate developer, building a strip center and low-income housing for the poor in Houston's Acres homes near where he grew up. Sergeant Chris Anderson, who tracked Batista for months, even admits that if Batista had applied himself in a legitimate business enterprise that he would have been successful. But there was a big problem. Personally, I suspect he enjoyed the adrenaline rush he got when he killed. It gave him a sense of power. He was a sociopath, Anderson said. He was determined to make something of himself, to be the best person he could possibly be, his girlfriend Bucci Ako told Texas Monthly. What triggered Redrick Batista's crime spree of murder may never be known, because his thoughts and motives perished in the ashes. Chris Anderson had his thoughts about Batista's reign of terror, though. Greed for money. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more. You can also join the show's Weirdos Facebook group on the contact social page at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Information in this episode comes from CrimeTraveler.org. Weird Darkness is a production of Marler House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness 2021. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And a final thought. Sometimes miracles are just good people with kind hearts. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.